Uh, thank you and welcome to the colloquium. I see we're uh, overflowing. Yeah, for those who don't want to stand in the aisles and in the back, there's alternative seating upstairs in the department uh, uh, seminar room 2205, I believe. And also uh, the talk will be streamed into the lobby on a screen out there. So if it gets oppressive in here, I encourage you to relocate out there. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Barry Barish, who is our speaker today. Barry is the Ronald and Maxine Lindy Professor of Physics Emeritus at Caltech. Barry got his uh, PhD, bachelor's and PhD, at the University of California in Berkeley, working up the hill at the, uh, at the Cyclotron facility there. He was then a research fellow at Caltech, and then on the faculty at Caltech beginning in 1966. Uh, uh, worked his way up to become Lindy Professor of Physics there. His research initially was in particle physics, uh, neutrino physics, search for magnetic monopoles. He led the gem detector development for the SSC, and more recently he's led uh, planning and discussions for the International Linear Collider. Uh, we know him here as uh, the principal investigator and then director of the LIGO laboratory from 1994 to 2006. As director, he expanded the LIGO collaboration enormously. Florida joined in 1996, and I think we were the third institution to come in uh, to the LIGO project. Uh, uh, but now there are 2,000 scientists and 100 different institutions as a member of the LIGO science collaboration. Barry was awarded an honorary PhD by Florida in 2007, so he's an alum of the Gators. He's um, a member of the National Academy, and you may remember was president of the American Physical Society in 2001. Uh, in 2017, Barry was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics, along with Ray Weiss and Kip Thorne, for decisive contributions to the LIGO detector in the observation of gravitational waves. So he's going to tell us about that today. Barry. Okay, it's nice to be back here. Uh, I've been giving a lot of colloquia, you can guess, but this one's a little different because this is the first talk of Gaines Fest, which is starting, and uh, a lot of the details and future and experts on LIGO are talking tomorrow. So I don't know how this will come out, but I'm gonna do a mixture, a little bit of a, a reminiscence of what I know. I've known Gaina a long time, and uh, I'm going to concentrate for LIGO on at least my view of what it took to make the discovery. So, uh, and leave most of the future to, to my colleagues uh, speaking tomorrow. So I don't know where to stand. But, uh, so first I have a letter to read Gaina, which actually predate, the person predates me. This is from Ugo Almaldi. And he is the person Gaina came West from the Soviet Union to work with at CERN, uh, and who alerted me to, it was the first person that alerted me to Gaina when Gaina was uh, coming to the super collider, so that, uh, as, as I'll say, we managed to recruit him into the project that we were working on. So pre prior to that, it was Ugo Amaldi. Ugo Amaldi is the son of Eduardo Amaldi who basically was one of the originators of the CERN laboratory and one of the most important scientists in Europe in post-World War II. Also, he was one of the key uh, people in Italy that in nuclear physics at, in, during World War II and before World War II, and the, the person who stayed in Italy when Fermi and others uh, left Italy. So uh, his, his son is Ugo Amaldi. And I'll read this, only I need some sort of glasses to read this thing. So this is to, to uh, uh, Gaina. Uh, for family reasons, I cannot be with you on this uh, festive occasion, and I regret it very much. But I am fortunate because our common friend Barry has willingly accepted to read these few lines, and Tiziano, uh, represents, at best, all your friends and colleagues of the Delphi times. Delphi was the experiment that uh, Gaina worked on when he came from the Soviet Union, collaborated on at CERN, 
before he came to the SSC. So this is 89 or 80, late 80s. You can correct me. Whatever I say wrong, because revisionist history is something I'm very good at. <laughs> Rather than expounding on the reasons of my admiration for your deep knowledge of physics and your calm and effective drive, I want to recall that the beginnings of our collaboration have their roots in the fraternal friendship between my father, Eduardo, and your master, Bruno Pontecorvo. In the 1930s in Rome, they were the youngest members of the famous group of Enrico Fermi, the boys of Via Penisperna, uh, which discovered the extraordinary power of slow neutrons. As you know, Fermi was uh, called the Pope, uh, Franco Rossetti, the Cardinal Vicar, uh, Emilio Segre, Segre, the Basilicis, and Eduardo, the little boy, and Bruno, the cub, all in Italian. Those are the Delphi collaboration was created in 1981, the year of LEP construction approval. And for 13 years, uh, I served as its spokesperson. Uh, from the beginning, I wanted to have two groups of scientists from the East to join us. It was easy to sign an agreement with Pavel Klyopnikov uh, of Serpikov Laboratory. But in spite of many discussions for many months, no conclusion could be reached with uh, JINR, which is Dubna, <clears throat> because too many group leaders belonging to two to different powerful Dubna laboratories wanted to join us. I was somewhat lost when I received from Bruno a long letter. After tactfully describing the situation in his wonderful Italian, he presented with very warm words you, one of my best PhD students. Eventually, the director of the institute, the famous theoretician Bogolyubov, decided that two groups, one led by yourself uh, and the other by uh, Siganov, would form the Dubna team in Delphi. But since none of the two teams, none of the two could be team leader, the overall leadership was given to Kadashevsky who in 1988 belonged to Bogolyubov as institute director. This was certainly the first time in high energy physics that two capable experimental groups have been led by a theoretical physicist. I've recounted this episode and many other interactions I had along the years with Bruno and the Dubna Laboratory in a paper presented at the Rome a conference for the 100 years of his birth. You've probably seen the paper, but he gave me a copy to give you. So, uh, The text, which contains a 1978 picture. Oh, first, this is Ugo Amaldi. And this is uh, Bruno Pontecorvo on the left, Emilio Segre, his Italian collaborator in the middle, and uh, Ugo's father, Eduardo Amaldi, on the right. And that, believe it or not, is Gannick with uh, uh, Bruno Pontecorvo. So he included this picture, um, and it's attached. And for your pleasure, I'm sure you've seen it and have it. When many years later you decided to leave Europe for the States, it was quite natural for you to ask me a letter of presentation for the SSC management. This was the beginning of your brilliant American career that I'm sure will be presented by many of the prestigious speakers at the Gwinnock Fest. Uh, not being with you, I can only add to their friendly wishes of many years of active and fruitful personal and professional life. Ugo. So that's when I come in. So I was at the Super Collider. And at that time, just to set the perspective, uh, the Super Collider was just under construction. And they decided to, that they would have two experiments, much like at CERN, like at the LHC, have two experimental detectors for the machine. And they developed some scheme where people put in early proposals uh, for the uh, uh, detectors, for the two detectors. And there was one big winner. It, it, it's called SDC, Solenoidal Detector Collaboration, run by George Trilling. And the other was a potpourri of proposals, uh, all of which kind of annihilated each other. And finally, the one that emerged on the top was uh, won by Sam Ting. But then the management at the lab didn't want a proposal of that group. 
And so they reopened the competition and asked uh, for, uh, to, they didn't, didn't reopen the comp competition. They made an invitation to two of us to put together the second proposal. And that was Bill Willis, who I think I have in a slide, maybe. I, I, I don't know. Uh, oh, yeah, that's just, this is his, at CERN, what Gainuk was doing. This is a summer school where Gainuk talked about uh, Ponte Corvo and his life with Ponte Corvo. And then he came to the Super Collider. So Gainuk came to the Super Collider. And at this time, I was working with Bill Willis, as I said. The other detector was done. But as you can imagine, what was the case is that there was one detector already in the system and a whole bunch of losers that wanted to work at the <laughs> Super Collider. And we were to pull this all together. This affects kind of the story of Gaina, as I'll say. So all these, and they all had different ideas. The reason there were different detectors isn't just personalities, but who believed in this kind of chamber, or a different kind of detector, and so forth. And uh, that was the pool of people that Bill and I had to pull together to form a, a second collaboration. And we formed that collaboration, that was okay, but then how do we sort out the fact that there are all these, which the other detector didn't have this trouble, all these different kinds of detector possibilities. At the same time, much of the, of the group of the young physicists that I respected the most had been absorbed in STC before it started in the other detector, so we were out talent searching as well. And the talent searching, came up with Gaina. Uh, I talked to Ugo, Bill Willis independently had worked a lot at uh, CERN, and so we went after Gaina and got him, but he made a demand, which he probably doesn't, not quite at the beginning. And that, and that demand was that we should build something, I don't know if you made up the name, but that's, it was called the Texas uh, Test Rig, TTR. Do you remember the, did you make the name up? I don't know. Yeah, the Texas test rig, which the idea was to test these different uh, kinds of tracking chambers and so forth and be able to tell both what they, how they performed, for, but for us to be able to make a, a real choice. And this is Gaina's style from the beginning, in my mind, is that uh, he combines incredibly the analytical powers of someone who was trained under Ponte Corvo with this incredible desire to build big things and make things work and so forth. So basically, that was where we were. And we, we finished this proposal. And then uh, they were building the super collider. This is a picture of the lab in Texas where they were testing the magnets that were coming off. This was the first series of magnets. That room looks like this now. So the super collider was, uh, was turned off in October of 1993. And it, in October of 1993, then, uh, we were ex an experimental group. So much of us went back to our universities, but we had put together a significant staff of talented people at the SSC itself, including Gaina. And so a big part of my job right at the beginning when, when the SSC was canceled was placing these people in decent jobs that it, we had attracted to the SSC. Gaina was easy, because everybody knew how good he was. And so he immediately was offered a position at, at uh, Fermilab. So Gaina went to Fermilab in 1994, I suppose, or 19, early 1994. And, uh, uh, and we stayed in communication uh, during that time. It, it really wasn't his dream job. He wanted, the dream job was here, but he didn't know it yet. And, uh, uh, but he landed in Fermilab. A lot of people, really talented people, didn't land anywhere or ended up on Wall Street or somewhere else doing some, something else. So it was a real disaster for a lot of talented physicists that I worked with at that time. But Gaina landed at Fermilab, a good place for most people, but he wanted something more like you have in a university like this. And the job offer opened here, I think, in 94. And so a year later or so, he came here. Uh, this is 1994, uh, so it's about the same time period. During that whole time, of course, we were in communication, and I was singing the praises of LIGO, which I had, uh, had joined. 
and uh, he was going to come, uh, was at Fermilab first working on, I think, CDF at Fermilab, and then coming here was going to work on the CERN experiment. And uh, uh, I guess mutually, I don't know whether he suggested or I did that he join LIGO. And uh, I think when he came, I don't know exactly, but he sent out a, a memo of kind of what the opportunities were. And certain people rose to that, including these two guys in the front row. And uh, the rest is history in that. So that's gain up, or at least part of it, until later. So uh, 1994, we had, uh, despite the fact that the SSC had turned off, we, were, we received the first construction funding uh, for LIGO. It had been proposed originally in in 1990, when the proposal was submitted in 1989-1990, and had gone through the trials and tribulations of kind of a, a proposal going through a system and some internal problems. In 1993, a year before this, the Virgo uh, Italian experiment was approved. There were four proposals to do gravitational waves, one in Australia, one in Germany, one in Italy, a uh, French-Italian collaboration called Virgo, and one in the US. And the Australian one was never acted on by the government. They just ignored it. The German one, which was the first to be acted on, maybe 1992 or 93, uh, told them they were too weak and to collaborate with the Scottish and to reduce the scope. And that ended up being a detector that's in Germany now called GEO. And at the same time, uh, that group, in doing that, became somewhat later interested in also joining LIGO, which they did. So they're part of LIGO and have a detector that's in uh, uh, Hanover, uh, Germany. And in 1994, 1993, the SSC was turned off. We had to resubmit a proposal for LIGO. Uh, we were more ambitious at that point, or I was. And uh, we started uh, construction within a year. So this is 1994. I show this picture not just to illustrate that we started construction, but made an important scientific decision at that moment. And that is the orientation of this, as I'll show in a, a few minutes, the orientation of how we do this is a strategic one. We have two detectors in LIGO. You'll hear a lot about them a little bit today and a lot about them over the next day or so. But there's a scientific question of how you orient the two with respect to each other. The curvature of the Earth is 16 degrees. The distance between them is 3,000 kilometers. But forgetting the curvature of the Earth, how do you orient them with each other? And there's two possible solutions. And people were very split on what to do. One solution is that you orient them somehow parallel to each other or upside down, but at least arms in the same direction. And the other solution is that they be at 45 degrees to each other. And this was a, a, a hard decision to make for some people, if they, especially if they were uh, theoretically inclined. Because if you orient them at 45 degrees, you get different information, added information, which we haven't gotten on LIGO itself. And that is that gravitational waves, like uh, electromagnetic waves, have a polarization. And you can determine the polarization if you put them at 45 degrees from each other. If you line them with each other, then the sig within the error of the 16 degree curvature of the Earth, you have the same detector looking at the same effect. So you should see identical signals. And you can tell from kind of the uh, uh, data you've seen of the announcement of gravitational waves, where we put one on top of each other to make a convincing case that we did what you do when you're trying to make a discovery, which is to make, it, make the most convincing case. So after a lot of discussion, we decided to align them uh, with each other. Florida, uh, with the stimulation of uh, GANA, came, became involved early. I, 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 coming from particle physics, wanted to have as talented a group as we could put together to do this incredibly difficult job of making this uh, device that could eventually detect gravitational waves. So I was interested in pulling in other people. And you can imagine that there was a lot of resistance because we were already funded. And it was Caltech and MIT who feel like they're at the top of the world. And so bringing in other people was, was a social problem, not just a problem of 
the logic of bringing in a strong group. So I wanted to make sure that we did it right at the beginning so people could buy off on it. And that is that we brought in groups that actually could contribute. And uh, Gaina, in parallel, had uh, recruited these two guys uh, who actually brought a lot of expertise in lasers and optics, something that we needed. And we were able to actually propose at the beginning to do something that they've stuck with for the years, and that is be the experts and produce the hardware that does the conditioning, or what we call the input optics, from the laser before it enters the interferometer. And so basically that's been a continuing role and an important one of the, of the group here in, uh, in Florida. And I must say, if I compare LIGO with Virgo, one of the big advantages we have is that we have a much more flexible um, way of treating the input optics. And they picked a particular configuration, which I think uh, hasn't been of great service. So anyway, uh, this is the, something to do with the input optics. OK, now I'm going to revert to a little history in LIGO. And my point is pretty simple. I want to try to show you a little bit how LIGO works as a precursor to tomorrow and give you my view, at least, my insight of what it took technically uh, what the, to, in order to, to, to detect gravitational waves. So first, uh, Gravitational waves come straight out of a uh, consequence of uh, special relativity and the fact that uh, Newton's theory of gravity basically has instantaneous action at a distance. Newton recognized that, actually. But, uh, and we know that if the, if the uh, sun burned out and light takes seven seconds to get here, the gravitational signal isn't going to come immediately. So there is a finite speed of transfer of energy, which is basically in special relativity, the speed of light. In general relativity, gravity has the same speed. It's called the speed of light because we saw light first. So gravitational waves basically come from some acceleration of masses physically and uh, propagate away as sources in space and in time at the speed of light. OK, so let me just. In one slide, many of you don't know general relativity, just write down one equation for you just to illustrate what the thing is that we're seeing. So what I've done here is pick a particular formulation of general relativity, and it's in the weak field limit, which isn't quite where we work in LIGO, but I think gives the illustration. So I've picked, uh, just to be formal about it, the Minkowski matrix, metric, and in the weak field limit, and in this case, the, uh, the uh, uh, equation that I get, whoops, I knew I'd screw this all up. Ah, OK. So the, the equation that I get here in the weak field limit, if I pick the particular features that I give here, the transverse traceless gauge, is an equation that looks very familiar. It's the wave equation. So it's what we learn when we do electricity and magnetism. It's basically the wave equation. And the little h mu nu on the right is called the strain. And it's, the, it's actually what we measure in LIGO. So we have an equation that looks a lot like we're used to in electricity and magnetism uh, in this limit, which is kind of a different presentation of what Einstein did in 1916, because he basically looked at the at general relativity and saw that he could get the wave equation. And since he could get the wave equation, there are probably waves. Therefore, therefore there's uh, gravitational waves. So he didn't develop it from first principles in 1916, but more or less the way I have here. Anyway, so we have a wave equation. So if we have the wave equation, we know what happens. And we have uh, a propagation of waves. In this case, the strain takes the form of a plane wave and they propagate at the speed of light. But if you look at this, there's one difference, and that is that uh, these are drawn at 45 degrees to each other. So the key difference between this and electromagnetic waves is that gravity is spin two, quantum mechanically, and uh, 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 electricity and magnetism spin one. So in electricity and magnetism, the B and the H fields are, the E and the H fields are at 90 degrees to each other. And this is kind of interesting, I think, because basically 
Uh, the, so you get something that we can decompose, I said, if we had the two detectors at 45 degrees. Or in our case, we started to be able to decompose it by using a third detector in Virgo, and maybe somebody will show that tomorrow. I, I'm not going to show that. So anyway, they're at 45 degrees from each other. But an interesting side remark is that the experiment we're doing is a classical physics experiment. But we basically can determine something quantum mechanically or prove it, and that is that gravity is spin two if we decompose these two waves at 45 degrees to, to each other. So anyway, so uh, gravitational waves themselves, let's look at so we can see how to detect them. And that's what I want to concentrate on. They're, they're first, they're ripples in space time itself. It's, and not, that not like the photon is for electromagnetic waves. So we, they basically are more like the ripples in a pond if you throw a stone in it that are just the water itself. So it, they don't have anything associated with it, although we test for that. And uh, we test to see if there's any so-called graviton, the equivalent of a photon, that's associated with gravitational waves. So far, we don't see one, and we set a pretty good limit. I'm not sure I'll get to showing that, but I might. The amplitude of the wave uh, that we detected and that we kind of targeted is a very small number. And I'm going to try to show you how small that is. That's the, that little strain, that little h in the equation, is a number of 10 to the minus 21. Uh, and that corresponds to something physical. And that is, it corresponds to the change of length over length. So basically, we change space time. Space is very stiff, if you think of it that way. And so when a gravitational wave goes through it, it doesn't distort it very much, a tiny amount. And the amount is this little h. And experimentally, or technically, it corresponds to a change of length over length at the frequency of the gravitational wave. So uh, if we start with a circle of free masses, so they can be moved, and then a gravitational wave goes through it, it will distort it in one direction by this delta l uh, and squish it in the other direction. And then it'll oscillate at the frequency of the gravitational wave, where it'll get bigger in the other direction and smaller in the other direction, and go back and forth at the frequency of the gravitational wave. So our challenge, experimentally, is to measure this delta L, which is related to the H. And its number, I said, is like 10 to the minus 21. You'll see that later. And if we have a one meter size, then we have to measure 10 to the minus 21 meters, which is pretty daunting. So instead, we make a detector that's bigger than a meter, kilometers, and in order to make this number more like 10 to the minus 18. I've summarized here the two numbers that uh, basically are the challenges then experimentally when you think about it. So first, we have at, shown here at one time every second or two a distortion of space time that's going to be basically uh, one part in 10 to the 21. Or if we make something a few kilometers long, about 4 10 to the minus 18 meters that we have to measure. And that's one one hundred, between 1 one hundredth and 1 one thousandth the size of a proton. So that's the challenge that we have to measure. And there are two problems in order to accomplish that. And I've kind of summarized everything down to two numbers. One is that anyone who's ever used an interferometer in a lab knows you see these fringes. And in our case, we see the equivalent of the fringes. And to do accurate interferometry, you so-called split the fringe. And in our case, we have to split the fringe by a factor of 10 to the minus 12. So that's the first challenge, that how well we have to do the interferometry itself. That's an incredibly small number. And it means we have to be really very, very good. And that's why there's so many innovations in the interferometry itself, and so much light used, and so forth, to be able to do this. The second big challenge, there's others, but I'm kind of encapsulating it for the purpose of this talk, is that we are doing this experiment here on Earth, but we don't want to be have anything to do with the Earth. We just happen to be here on the Earth. So basically, the difference between this interferometer and the interferometers that uh, you used or saw in a freshman or sophomore physics lab is you went in the lab and got your mirrors. And you put them on an optical table, and you bolted them down. And if you did a good job and ran the light around, you saw fringes. And then you 
God did good in your lab. In our case, we can't do any of that because the Earth moves much more than the effect that we're trying to measure. So we live here on Earth, but we have to isolate ourselves completely from the Earth. We know how to do that pretty well, and I'll, I'll talk about that, and it's kind of key to this, but with the amount is incredible. We have to basically get rid of the shaking of the Earth by a factor of, <coughs> another factor of 10 to the 12th. So that's the, the big challenge, is that these two numbers tell you that you have to do the interferometry incredibly well, and you have to isolate yourself from the Earth incredibly well. Now, there are other challenges, but that's the two that I'll pick on uh, for the purpose of this talk. So, so we use interferometry, which can measure this difference. And in general, in experimental physics, it's hard to measure something absolutely, the length of a meter stick or the weight of a kilogram. And that's why we have these institutes, like the National Institute, of, uh, to measure the standards, to measure the, to the standard. Or in Paris, there's a big thing. But in physics, we're lucky that we have, in general, techniques to measure the difference between two things that are basically the same. That we can do more accurately often. And in one of the best ways of doing that is interferometers that measure the difference between two perpendicular directions, which is perfect for our, our job, because we have the squashing and squeezing, so it's a well-matched uh, job. But the interferometer itself has to be sat satisfy these two conditions. So let's go on. I'm, when we work uh, with this interferometer and we want to detect signals, there's whole classes of signals we have to worry about. I've only listed them here to make you know that what we've talked about so far isn't the whole story. We'll talk the rest of this talk about the compact binary in spirals. That's this thing here. And that's what we've seen. There's other sources that uh, one is, then this gives the so-called chirp signal, which I'll talk about a little bit. A second possible source, uh, one that's been looked for for a long time, is, uh, uh, and we haven't seen very many supernova in our own galaxy, but a uh, burst type signal like a supernova, or gamma ray burst, something that gives a burst like signal. That's the second kind of source. There's now some overlap between these, but the uh, third one is a source that's periodic. This is like uh, a, a pulsar or spinning neutron star in our own galaxy that gives electromagnetic signals that are seen. And if, to the extent that it has any sort of quadrupole moment, will give uh, uh, gravitational wave signals. And lastly, we could see signals from the early universe. So all of these are possibilities. And we're only lo looking at this. I only show that to say that there's a wide variety of science that's going to come out of gravitational wave physics, I'm not going to touch much on the future. And we're just opening the door. And we're just seeing the first of these at this uh, present time. So, uh, so as I said, in 1993, the story started when the first large-scale experiment was approved. And that was in Italy. And it was a combination of an Italian-French collaboration. The leaders of that experiment are these two gentlemen here, Alain Brier, who's French and Alberto Giazzotto, who was uh, Italian, they got together. Uh, Brier was kind of an expert on interferometry. And Giazzotto, I'm going to show you, was uh, basically an expert, or became an expert on how to isolate yourself from the ground. So that was his thing. And originally, it was a French and Italian collaboration. And it's grown to include uh, four other countries. And especially Holland has brought it great strength in the present, uh, I don't know what he's called, spokesperson of their collaboration is from Poland. And they've really made a big impact on the experiment. So this is Virgo. It was approved in 1993. And I show that for two reasons. One, I'm going to circle back to them later. But we were in competition with these guys since 1993. And it's an odd competition. At, at CERN, we have competition between ATLAS and CMS. Uh, and in some way, they show a unified thing, but they're in competition. We were in competition, but at the same time, uh, recognized all of us from a very early time that we also could benefit from collaboration. So, and that, this is because a gravitational wave signal, when it comes to the Earth, 
uh, hits everywhere. So if we add the information that they might see from the same gravitational wave signal that we see, and you'll see some of that in the talks in the next couple of days, that uh, there's a lot to be gained, including something I already talked about, the polarization. So they add information on the polarization and especially on our ability to tell the direction that a gravitational wave came from. So we had this odd connection where we were in collaboration and in competition. And, uh, and these guys were very competitive, I can tell you, especially, especially uh, Alberto. So everything that we did that would help us both, there was always a suspicion that it was some way. We, we decided in 1997, which was very early, that we would do something that was to us very revolutionary. We, we invited uh, one of the uh, member, senior members to spend a year at Caltech in 1997 of this collaboration and we developed the data format, which is the one we use today, in concert so that we would use the same data format, which meant that the experiments are different, but if the data, the style, the way that the data was put together, it made it easier, much easier for us in LIGO to analyze Virgo data or vice versa. So this is going on at the same time we were trying to beat each other to the punch. Uh, okay, so LIGO was approved a, a, a year later in 1994. There's two LIGOs, one in, uh, we proposed it by the way, uh, in to be, we were not allowed to say where it should be, but we managed to, to give them information on what we called sample sites. And the sample sites were one in California, not so far from Caltech, in the Edward, near the Edwards Air Force Base, and one in southern Maine, not so far from MIT. So this was a Caltech-MIT collaboration. It then went into the political system, and it got rotated by 45 degrees. <laughs> And we got a very friendly senator, especially from Louisiana, but both from Louisiana and Washington as, as a result. So this was funded in 1994. And the key technical thing to realize is that these are uh, 3,000 kilometers apart from each other. So if a gravitational wave comes this direction, it's going to hit Hanford 10 milliseconds before Livingston. Or if it comes this direction, 10 milliseconds at Livingston before Hanford, or if it came straight down, they would be in direct coincidence. So it means that we can demand within our errors that they be within plus or minus 10 milliseconds of each other, and that's what we do. And we look at how much false kind of coincidences we can have. This is equivalent to how you tell how many sigma, which I'm not gonna go into, uh, by looking at off time. So if we look at when one of the detectors is not in coincidence with the other, and all the bins that that's possible, we can add up enough bins to see what the background random coincidences are between the two of them. And that's how we tell how significant any signal is that is in coincident time. But we demand them to be within this coincident time if, the, if we expect a coincidence. These are the two detectors, uh, the two interferometers. They're in very different physical uh, environments. The environment in, in uh, Hanford is high desert. Um, in fact, when we were there and started building LIGO, we had a um, contract that went a certain depth to get to water. You can't construct without water. And so we went to that depth, did not hit any water. We happened to be on the DOE reservation there. They were very nervous about or any individual, nobody was nervous, but no individual wanted to take the responsibility of letting us dig deeper. Uh, we had a lot, hard time getting, finally, agreement to go deeper than we eventually got water and build it. In Louisiana, there's nothing but water. So uh, basically, what you see here is the same interferometer. And in Louisiana, we had to build uh, a berm, just like they do the roads, to get it up high enough so it doesn't flood. We went up. Uh, to the 500-year floodplain and then added a meter because that's not Gaussian and we wanted to be higher. But in the, in the process, it, we had a borrow pit along the side where we took the dirt to make the, the uh, berm. And of course, it immediately filled up with water, fish, alligators, and so forth. 
So basically, that's what we had. These instruments, even though they're in such physically different places, are, as much as we can do it, are identical. They're identical instruments, and we try hard to make sure that anything we do in one is also done in the other. And for most of the running we've done through the years, their performance, unless there's some re technical problem in one place or the other, are pretty much identical. And I, I'll show you at least one graph of that. Our last run, they weren't very identical, but that was for kind of special reasons. But they basically can be thought of as being identical, two identical instruments. Um, this is just the construction itself. We used uh, uh, thin stainless steel, wrapped it in a spiral weld. We made this big uh, vacuum pipe. The reason I show it mostly is to show you that the pipe, you could imagine a laser beam's not very big. We made it more than 1.2 meters in diameter. And the reason for that is, I think, twofold. One is that uh, if the pipe is bigger, then any sort of stray light that scatters off the sides is reduced. And secondly, it's our laboratory. So we have to work at high vacuum. I'll show you that. And if we work at high vacuum, our whole laboratory is basically inside this vacuum. So we gave ourselves enough room to do that. In the end, then, we have 1.2 meter diameter pipe, uh, 16 kilometers of it in the two labs, and running at 10 to the mi at pumped down to 10 to the minus 9 tor. That's called high vacuum. And that's the biggest high vacuum system in the world, not the biggest vacuum system. The biggest vacuum system is the CERN vacuum system, but they don't keep everything at high vacuum in the, when you have the magnets and so forth. So, uh, so we're the second biggest vacuum system in the world, and uh, that basically is our, our laboratory. Uh, this is the infrastructure then, and what we did early was to build, these are the tanks that have in them the mirrors or the, uh, uh, and so forth that are the different instruments. The thing here was a very special gate valve because our pipes are so big. We had to design a gate valve big enough. What's a gate valve? It closes off this long vacuum from where the heart of the instrument is, the mirrors and the laser and so forth, because we never want to bring this huge thing up to air. We never have. So the long vacuum, 10 to the minus 9 tor, stays at 10 to the minus 9 tor, even if we go in and work on the instruments and, uh, themselves. And all these ports and things, when we designed these, basically took into account all the ideas we had for how the instrument might evolve. Uh, this was done um, in 1990, early 1994, with the idea that we wanted to be able to build a second generation for LIGO, uh, but that it would be hard to get money to rebuild the infrastructure of LIGO. We wanted to, as much as possible, make the proposal for what we envisioned as a second generation, which we now call Advanced LIGO, by the way. At that time, we called it LIGO 2, but the NSF didn't like LIGO 1, 2, maybe 3, and so forth. So they made us rename it Advanced LIGO. But the idea was that we would, as much as possible, put in a new instrument that had better technologies, but not have to rebuild any more than we had to the infrastructure uh, itself. So we made a more elaborate infrastructure than we needed at the, at the beginning. There's no person. I didn't happen to pick one that had a person size, but a person goes up to maybe here on this picture. So it's not the size of the CERN detectors, but it's still pretty big. OK, so now we'll talk a little bit about the interferometry. And I want to basically show you what limits it and key you in on what I think is the elevator speech, if you want, for what we did to detect gravitational waves. So first, uh, <coughs> I mentioned the gas. We, we, basi the, we basically have to, with four kilometer arms, and the arms themselves are Fabry pearl cavities, I think with 300 bounces roughly. Um, and with all that light traveling back and forth, we have to work at uh, high vacuum. So that's to prevent residual gas scattering. And the resi residual gas scattering, the simple reason we need it is that anything that doesn't follow a straight line is going to have a different path length than otherwise if it can find its way back. So we worry about 
scattering of molecules, finding the walls or somewhere, and finding a different path, but not being the same time or phase when it comes back. So that's the first one. Uh, the second is the laser itself, where we have to have a laser that's not only single line, it's a neodymium YAG laser um, in the infrared, but that it uh, basically is very, very stabilized in its uh, wavelength and, and amplitude fluctuations and so forth. So the laser is the second thing that's very stable, very special, and uh, we work on very hard, and it's a limiting factor even today in what we do. Uh, third one, which is the one I'm going to concentrate on in terms of this little elevator speech, is seismic noise. And you remember that I said we had to isolate ourselves by a factor of 10 to the 12th from the ground. And I'll, I'll show you where we are on that. And that is the fact that we, the way we keep ourselves isolated from the ground is to basically um, try to have a system that, that isn't, instead of put on an optical, tab optical table and down, we use a system of first pe a pendulum hanging so the masses or mirrors are hanging from wires. And so they basically want to move. That's an added problem. We don't have the stability that you have here. And they want to move back and forth. But as you know, if you take a pendulum and you move the top, it doesn't translate very much to the pendulum, to the mass itself. And uh, we build in a bunch of isolators. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So that's a seismic noise, and I'll come back to that. A third limitation, and it's one that we're pointing for as improvements in the future, especially is thermal noise. And that is that the, the mirrors at the end, which are also our so-called test masses to be moved, uh, are at room temperature. So at room temperature, we have Brownian motion or KT noise. And one of the big desires, and one of the things we're being worked on in Japan in their present version is to reduce the temperature. And so much of reducing the temperature isn't just reducing the temperature. If we reduce the temperature, you have to somehow get the heat out without shaking the test mass. And you have to have materials that will reflect and so forth and so on. So it's a major problem to lower the temperature, but it's the future. So that's thermal noise. And then finally, we try to get to measure this very tiny number by getting more and more photons. And if we get enough photons, then that creates uh, pressure on the, on the, on the mirrors, uh, which here. And so we get a trade-off between basically shot noise or photostatistics and uh, Brownian and uh, pre radiation pressure on the mirror. They, that's called quantum noise. And you'll see it in the plot that I show. So if you put that all together, you get a, a schematic graph that I've shown here that shows basically what you can do. On the, on the left, is here's the magic 10 to the minus 21, which is more or less just the scale you want to be at. And all these lines are the different things. This is the vacuum. If the vacuum were 10 to the minus 6 tor, we'd be here. If it's 10 to the minus tor, we're 9 tor, we're down here. And so this is close enough to where we have sensitivity that we decided to go for high vacuum from the very beginning. And all these other ones are just different things that could limit us. The actual limiting factors are the three lines, one that goes this way, one that goes this way, and one that goes this way. And anything above that is what's sensitive. So this is the sensitive region. You're more sensitive if you go down this plot. And of course, the sweet spot, the place where we're the most sensitive, is somewhere in here. At low frequencies, we're limited by seismic noise. That's the shaking of the Earth. This is schematic, but basically it falls like frequency to the fourth power. So it falls incredibly rapidly. And uh, that means we hit a wall here, and we have to basically isolate ourselves from this. I'll show you how. At high frequencies, we're limited by what interferometer people call shot noise. It's basically photostatistics in a crude way. And so how many photons you have limits you here. And in between is what I showed as the thermal noise, or the, the KT noise in the test masses themselves. This is basically a nightmare experimentally. Most of us are used to experiments where you have one, 
one experimental effect that limits you and you beat that down and maybe you find another one. We have to battle three at the same time with many things lurking down below. And the whole game is to press, push these uh, down as low as we can. Also, the total frequency band that we're in here is only a small part of the frequency band that's available. It's what we really have available to us on the Earth. And it's basically the uh, uh, frequency band, that the audio frequency band, the frequency band that our ears work in. And basically, evolution has picked that for us as where the Earth is quiet enough. If our ears responded at lower frequencies, there would be too much noise. We see why it's going up. And at high frequencies, uh, you can't sample fast enough. So basically, we have nothing to do with audio, but we have the same problem. At high frequencies, we're limited by number of photons, and at low frequencies, by the shaking of the Earth. So we have the, so we, what we're, what the laboratory available to us on the Earth's surface is basically the audio band. Tomorrow, people will talk, I hope, about LISA a little bit and other possibilities that look at the other frequency bands. And very much like for astronomy, where we basically have done so well by using information on the same phenomena in different frequency bands, the same will be true for gravitational waves uh, eventually. So all these frequency bands matter, but we've exploited first the one on the Earth's surface. That's the laser. This is the, uh, a picture of a test mass. They're big pieces of fused silica. Are the present test masses, they weigh 40 kilograms. And to the eye, they look like an enormously beautiful piece of glass that you can look right through. Uh, but they're coded to, re to reflect in the infrared uh, at the wavelength of the, of the laser. Uh, this is basically the message and what I want to concentrate on. This was the original uh, schematic of the original setup for the first 10 years of LIGO, which is a, basically a uh, test mass with, hung by wires. They were piano wire. And uh, using little uh, magnet actuators to stabilize where the mirror is. Uh, and hung, as I say, by a wire like that. And that was basically the setup that we have. The way we isolated ourselves from the Earth was by using basically the same system you use in your car, which is shock absorbers. A shock absorber, when you go over a bump in the road, can't get rid of the energy, but it takes the energy from the bump and smooths it out to lower frequency where it doesn't bother you and you go nicely over it and you feel good. We do the same thing. We want to transfer the shaking of the Earth outside of our frequency band. We did it by making shock absorbers that were a little fancier than the ones in your car. We picked very carefully the squishiness of the springs and so forth, but basically they're shock absorbers. We had several layers of it so that what, it, what wasn't removed in one layer would be removed in the next and the next and so forth. So basically, that's where we were. And we started running LIGO. And I've shown the evolution from 201 to 205, which brought us almost to the design of this initial detector. So the way we ran LIGO was to basically do a lot of technical work, do it as well as we could, take data for a period of months, uh, unfortunately see no gravitational waves, lick our wounds, figure out uh, what improvements we hadn't made yet, what we had learned from that run, and then run again. We had a total of six runs on this initial configuration. But when we got down to here, it wasn't going to get any better without doing some major changes, which is the changes to what we call uh, advanced LIGO. So these are discrete improvements. And finally, you can see that it follows this line a little bit worse at low frequencies, but basically by 2005 or so. We kept running till 2008 or 2009. But by, by this point, we had pretty much gotten to where we could go with the initial configuration of LIGO. Uh, this is just shown, I'm not going to go through it in detail, to say that we know when I, we show this, we have technologies and ability to understand what limits this. And this is just a decomposition of the different sources that make this background. So we could understand it and know how to improve things. OK. In parallel with this, in, in Italy, 
And Ricardo de Salvo, who, uh, like, like I hired Gaina, I hired into, into LIGO, some of you might recall. So he came from high energy physics and was uh, the inventor at CERN of what's called the spaghetti calorimetry that people have heard of. And I knew him from that. And he then went to, left CERN and went, because he was hired to go to work with Virgo. And basically, along with Giazzotto, who I mentioned before, developed this incredible passive system of seismic isolation. Uh, and then the two of them didn't get along very well, and so I hired Ricardo to come to, to Caltech, and uh, he's still in, in LIGO. So uh, this then is basically the history that shows something interesting, which I'll, I'll show you, which is this is LIGO, and this is Virgo. And you'll notice that the lowest frequencies that, uh, th and this is 100 hertz, at the lower frequencies, for all those years, they were better than us. Life could have been very different. It could have been that uh, the black holes were enough so that they could have seen them and us not for many years. And not many people recognize that. Giazzotto certainly did. Uh, but it was because we basically didn't have this fancy system at low frequencies that was developed by Giazzotto and Ricardo de Salvo. I was very aware of this. Uh, Giazzotto always wanted to show not so much low frequency black holes, nobody knew they'd exist, but the pulse, known pulsars, there's a zillion of them at low frequencies. So he always thought first they have a single detector that they would discover gravitational waves before us and that we couldn't see them because they were at low frequencies and would be seen by them. Somehow nature favored us. So anyway, by the end of Initial LIGO, this is where we were. There's two con different configurations for two final runs seen here, but basically the uh, line drawn is our, our resolution. The optical configurations are a little different in these two. I won't go into that. But except at the lowest frequencies, we pretty much followed what we wanted. So we set a goal, and that is to make an advanced version, next version of LIGO that was at least a, a factor of 10 better over the whole frequency band. At high frequencies, you improve it and get the factor of 10 by having a more powerful laser, basically. At middle frequencies, by somehow, and I'll show you how, improving the test mass and suspensions. And at low frequencies, by somehow having better isolation. I showed you already that the Italians had better isolation than we did. So uh, we had a complicated thing. I'm not going to go through this for everything that we did to make a more powerful advanced LIGO. And I just, for completeness, have shown them all here, uh, which invo involved a lot of um, interferometry, different kind of configuration, which I just don't have time to go into. And um, improvements of a higher power laser, a bigger mirror, and so forth. But the key to the actual detection we made is in this graph here. So what we did is that uh, basically, as I said, the, the isolation that we had in the beginning was all passive. And we decided to add active seismic isolation. This we started working on in 1999. And uh, the idea is simple, and it's exactly the same idea as the headphones that you wear when you get it on an airplane. So when you get it on an airplane and you bought these fancy Bose headphones, they basically cancel the ambient noise from the engines. You still hear the stewardess talking to you because it's only the ambient noise that it, it cancels. So this, we have the same idea. Our problem is harder because we have to correct not for noise, audio noise again, but motion. And we have to know the direction of the motion. You don't care where the engines are in an airplane, but we have to care what the direction is of the motion. So we have to correct the direction of, of the gravitational wave signal and uh, that's done by having the layers of passive isolation and then a system we developed to sense and correct, uh, move the test mass to correct for the motion, and we do it in six dimensions, the three linear dimensions and the rotations of the, of the three. So what we ended up with is shown here. We have a, a multiple pendulum instead of a single pendulum moving electronics off the test mass itself and having the controls by moving the upper test masses. 
and adding the active seismic isolation. And we end up with this graph here. This is where we were when we turned on and made the discovery uh, uh, of gravitational waves. At high frequencies, we had improved a factor of three. The line on the bottom is, the line on the top is where we were after initial LIGO. At the bottom, the line is where we will be when we achieve our design in advanced LIGO, but we had improved a factor of three. That's a big improvement because what we measure and what I showed you on an early slide is an amplitude, not a power. And because we measure an amplitude, it means that tells us how far we look out in the universe. So looking for uh, binary in spirals, if we look twice as far out, we have eight times the volume. So we gain as the cube. So a factor of three improvement gives us a factor of 27 uh, improvement in sensitivity. And so we quickly make up for everything that was done in initial LIGO. At low frequencies, you remember we weren't very good, we actually gained a factor of 100. And so we gained effectively a factor of a million. And so when people have asked me, how did we detect it so quickly when we hadn't done it in 10 years? It's this factor of, of 100 cubed that made it possible to detect in advanced LIGO when we couldn't do it uh, in initial LIGO. So the elevator speech is active seismic uh, isolation. Uh, just a couple more words. The, uh, uh, the discovery and the way we have looked for this first class of events has involved looking for the style was to calculate, and it took many years to do this, the waveform in detail of all the different configurations of two binary systems coming together. And we compare several hundred thousand templates with the noise. You can do this and pick out a signal that's buried in the noise because it has a known shape and lasts for some period of time. So I show that here. That on the bottom left is, the, is from the dots of where we do, how we cover the space that we can cover, roughly 100 by 100 uh, uh, solar mass particles, and we do what's called match filtering. That is, we run a known waveform, and when it gets to a point where you see data has it buried in it, it'll pick a big spike, and we find that. So that was the main way that we have and search using uh, the known templates to see the signal. We have another system. And that was actually developed by our local hero, uh, Komenko and Mitzelmacher. And that is to not use the prejudice of a long wavelength, wave form like I showed you, but actually to look in as sensitive a way as you can without prejudicing the science for a burst, of, a burst signal. And that was developed. And I, I picked on purpose to, very, to show you this wasn't done just for advanced LIGO. This is dated, I think, 2003, if I can read it right, or 20. This is a publication in 2004, where they were already trying this on very early data. This is the second run of LIGO, uh, looking for what they call wave burst signals. And this is the publication they did in 2004. And this is just how well it could, uh, it, it could measure things. A little known fact is that in September of 2015, when we detected gravitational waves, the first system that I showed you was not operational. And the signal that was seen very early was seen, and people saw it was recognized, and everybody points to the fact that some German saw it as the first person in Hanover. And that was because we were all asleep. It happened at 4 in the morning in, in the US. Uh, but the reason it could even be done then was because of Gaina and Klemenko, the two of them had developed the system, which we had for 10 years, because that's how the, the recognition was made uh, right after the uh, detection. So they basically saw this beautiful signal at, um, at that point. And I think that I'm going to end here um, because it's time and because you're going to hear the rest of the stuff. Oh, I'm going to show one more plot just to emphasize the low frequency. This is the time frequency plot of that first signal where I've emphasized the low frequency part that required the factor of a 100 gain. And you can see that if you didn't see all the low tail, even though everybody points to the high 
to this part of the graph where the signal gets very big, if that was gone, it would have been very hard to uh, detect. So uh, basically the improvement at low frequency was essential. I just want to come to a last graph and I'm going to end. This is all the stuff I would have shown if, uh, if it wasn't Gaina's uh, thing. So basically, let me uh, end with this graph here first. And that is that uh, what I haven't mentioned, I did mention the other kind of science. You'll hear some of, of what I'll say now, I hope, in the next day or two. But much like astronomy, we've actually opened one frequency band to look for gravitational waves. And as we go forward, you can expect it to be like astronomy, that we'll be looking at different bands. We look at, uh, we look at phenomena that happen on millisecond time scales. If we were to look at events that happen on slower time scale, minutes to hours, you have to go into space for the reasons that I said. That's an experiment called LISA, which is now uh, an approved experiment in Europe, and we hope NASA rejoins it soon, and that'll be in, in the 2030 time frame. The third one is if you go to a phenomenon that happened on years and decades, and that's uh, what's called pulsar timing. That's an experiment that uh, is underway and measures the fact that these accurate spinning pulsars send a signal, but if a gravitational wave came through the Earth, the actual signal from several of these would change relative to uh, what we're used to, and you could detect very low frequency gravitational waves. At the very lowest frequency, you can see actually billions of year time scales you can go back to trying to study something that I think is the ultimate goal in my mind for gravitational waves, and that is the early universe. First, by seeing the imprint of gravitational waves, people have tried to do that, but it hasn't happened yet, on the cosmic microwave background. The electromagnetic waves are, are absorbed after three, before 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And so we can see the imprint on those, maybe, with gravitational waves, and that's probably the first thing that'll be done. Ultimately, the fact that uh, electromagnetic waves are, are absorbed, the ultimate way to get back to the Big Bang is with something that doesn't get absorbed. There's two possibilities, neutrinos, and they don't get quite back as far, and gravitational waves. Neutrinos from the very early universe are thermalized, and so they're so low in energy, there's no hope to detect them. But gravitational waves from the very early universe certainly could be detectable, not with the detectors we have today, but, uh, but eventually, I think. So with that, I'll, it's a preview for tomorrow. I'll end and uh, a special cheer for Dana.